Good morning. I want to offer my voice of welcome to you and say that we are thrilled you are here to worship with us. Um, This morning, we're going to bring our Easter series to a close. Yes, I know Easter was last week, but we don't stop celebrating Easter, okay? Okay. Wow. Look at you all excited about Easter. The candy is like 75% off at Walmart now. Does that get you excited? Okay, just checking. No, um, we've, we've kind of gotten to this point where we don't just keep Easter on Easter Sunday and Palm Sunday. We kind of expand it just a little bit, and, and eventually it may become a bigger thing than what it is at this point. Uh, Nathan's been pushing for that. Uh, but this is, this is a good thing for us to focus in on, and this year we've been looking at Jesus as King. And so uh, we go back to Palm Sunday, and we looked at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and, and we looked at Him being a humble king. He had come to set free the hearts of those who would believe, but the world was looking for a ruler who was going to assume a worldly throne. What he did was he showed them that his kingdom was one that looked very different from their expectations. And within a matter of days, right, the town goes from cheering, uh, save us, uh, Hosanna in the highest. He's, they're, they're cheering him on. And within days, they've turned and they're, they're, they're shouting out, crucify him. If he wasn't going to free them politically, if he wasn't going to free them physically, he wasn't the king they were looking for. Then last week, last week, Easter, right? Started out at the pavilion for some of you in a very cold metal seats out there. And, and, and Nathan came in this morning. He's like, this would be a great day for a sunrise service. <laughs> yes, yes, it would. I want, we about sent out a text and said, get here now. It's warm and the sun's coming up. Um, no, it was beautiful though. We talked about our risen, our risen King out there. Then we came in for Easter in here and we talked about our resurrected King and, and, and what we saw was, was here, here was a King, right? Who had defeated death. He had conquered sin and he's paved this way to personal relationship with God. He endured the very worst death. He was denied by his closest followers and he was placed in a borrowed tomb, but he didn't stay there. He he gave his followers this eternal hope as he rose from the dead and revealed himself to them. He returned from the dead. It was unexpected, right? It shouldn't have been because they had heard the prophecies. They knew that this was coming, but they missed it. And they get to the tomb and he's not there because he's alive. Oh, man. They just, they didn't, I mean, it was foretold, but, but they didn't pay attention apparently. And so by doing this, by him coming back, right, he's given us the privilege to follow in his steps. We get to share the story of our King Jesus who changed the world forever. He gave us the the perfect example to follow, and he's promised to return yet again for his church, for his bride. He's coming back. Now, We're going to pause here for just a moment because this is exciting stuff, okay? The fact that Jesus is coming back for the church is something that should make us almost dance. We're Baptist, I know, I get it. We should almost dance. I didn't say, could you hear that carefully there, right? This should get us excited. The fact that he's going to come back for us. And so that's, that's what we're talking about today, right? This, this promised return. Go, we're going to go back to Jesus' final meal with the disciples, looking at what occurred there and focusing in on this day, th- 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 this idea that Jesus will one day be our returning king. And it's not going to be the same when he was here the first time. I, I, this, is, this is big. Here's the thing. Well, well, something we're looking for, right? I mean, those of you that have been in the church, I've been in the church my whole life, and all I've heard from, from the time I was born, Jesus is coming back, right? So we, we're looking for it. We, we might be anticipating, but I think there's some truth in thinking that the church doesn't really focus on this all that much. We kind of, we know it's there. We know it's going to happen, but we kind of, we claim to believe he's coming, We're even bold enough to say, hey, it's closer than it's ever been. There's even those of us that will say, you know, you look at the signs of the time, it's getting, it's almost here. But, but there's a lot of times we get distracted, right? We say we want it to happen, but we get distracted in the here and the now. And, and, 
and the returning king becomes a distant thought. I mean, I, I, I as a pastor, right, I should want Jesus to come back as soon as possible, more than, it, more than most. But in the back of my mind, there's this thing that goes, you've heard how good grandparenthood is. And you've paid your dues with the four blessed blessings that you've given us. Right? And if Jesus comes back, do I not get to be a grandparent? I, I'm just being honest with you. We have the, don't you? Please be, t- tell me that you have thoughts of, I really want to see this come to fruition in my life. Instead of, God is better than anything, and if we fully understood what he was coming back with, that's all we would want. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm saying things, aren't I? Th- th- I'm just being honest with you, right? He becomes a distant thought because we get focused here. Remember the cheers and the shouts of joy proclaiming, Jesus save us as he entered Jerusalem? They had watched. They had waited. He was there. Really, this should be us each and every day declaring, Jesus, come and take your church. We want to be with you. We want you with us. Return to us and rule in your majesty. That's what we should be declaring as the church. We should want this. We should long for this. Along, along with that mindset, we should, we should just, all we should want is his return. I mean, we know how bad the world is, don't we? we we've had a foretaste of what's coming. Anything that's coming is gonna, with him, it's going to be unbelievable. The other part of this is, is if we're in this mindset of longing for his return, it should drive us to a sense of urgency to share the gospel with a lost world. See, I think it's fair to say that we believe in a returning king, but we truly don't think he's coming that quickly. We we, we think we have this this time to enjoy the world, which I don't know why we want to enjoy this world when we know what's happening in the, the eternal, right? But we want to enjoy this world, and we'll tell others about Jesus when it fits into our schedule or when we have time. And while, yes, we should proclaim he is risen. He is risen. Pretty good. First service got you beat. Yeah, there's competition. You don't know it, but there is. Why we should be proclaiming that, we should all pro- also should be proclaiming that he is coming. We say, thank you. <laughs> Look at that. My front row people. But that's, we should. We should be telling people his, his, Im- his return is imminent. It's going to happen. Are you ready for his return? So we're going to hop into our main passage this morning out of Luke. We're going to go back before his crucifixion, and we're going to read about this last supper that he has with his disciples, which means today in our time of response, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper together as his body, as one. So start to to set your minds that way. Start to prepare your hearts for that. But as you do that, let's go ahead and start reading in Luke chapter 22, verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So Passover's arrived. They've made it to Jerusalem. Here they are. And Jesus calls them together and he he, he reclines at the table. The disciples, they're, they're gathered around him. And from everything I've studied, it says this is really a formal dinner setting. This is what it looks like to be formal. Reclined at the table, everybody gathered around. I'm like, in my house, we eat at the little coffee, I shouldn't tell this, coffee table with the TV. And we sit like this. We're not reclined at all. We got one of those nice ones that like pops up so we can now actually sit up and eat. It's good stuff. But Jesus, Jesus is like, come on, guys. I mean, we see the, (laughs) you see the picture, the painting of the Last Supper, right? I I don't think they were all on one side of the table. Maybe they were. (laughs) That'd be awkward. But he gets them in there. He gets them all set up. The other part of this is that, I mean, the seating arrangement that they did was for special occasions only. 
They didn't eat this way normally. This, this was for the Passover. He's about to share his last intimate meal with these disciples. He knows that suffering is coming. He says, before I suffer, I want to do this with you guys, with this group of men. So, so, and, and they're doing it kind of in secret, but the reason they're doing it in secret is not because Jesus is scared of suffering. It's just not his time to suffer yet. He's not trying to avoid anything. Suffering is destined for Jesus. But before that, he just wants to have this meal. He wants to, to share the Passover with the 12. Judas is there, right? The one that's going to betray him is included in this. He's saying, I want to share this with all of you. Now, our, our, our passage cuts off here, but right after this, he starts talking about the one that's going to betray him. But he still brought him to the table. He still served him the supper. This is the last time that Jesus is going to eat Passover until he eats it with them in the kingdom of God. I mean, do we get that? That, that the next time Jesus does this, we're with him. Okay, we got like two of you. We're almost there. No, this, I mean, this is huge. The next time that Jesus particip participates in the Lord's Supper is in heaven, in God's kingdom, and we're there with him. Oh my, this, this should, I mean, it blows my mind to think about this, that here he is, he's telling the guys, we're going to do this here, but it's the last time that I'm going to partake of either of these till we're together in my God's kingdom. Just as the Passover pointed forward to and anticipated the fulfillment of all of God's promises, in the same way, the Lord's Supper reminds us of the day where all believers will feast in God's kingdom. It's truly going to be the greatest festival that still awaits believers. Jesus, he gives thanks for God's provision, instructing the disciples to take this cup, to share it. This, this cup, this first cup they take, it symbolizes the joy and the fellowship that these disciples share with one another and with Jesus at this meal. They're, they're partners in a great cause. They're friends and brothers in God's kingdom. Jesus declares, I'm not doing it again till we meet in my Father's kingdom. This points to Jesus' return. It tells us he's coming back because he wouldn't say, I'm going to do this with you in the kingdom and not return for him. The bread symbolizing his broken body. The cup speaking of his blood that inaugurates the new covenant. A moment between Jesus and his closest friends that should cause us to kind of reflect on just what it means when we think about our returning king and remember him by, by gathering around his table together. This morning, as we look at Jesus as returning King, I want us to prepare our hearts for a meal together. I want us to truly focus in on who Jesus is, and, and I want us to start to long for his return. I want us to want him to come back more and more. What we see in Luke's Gospels are these words that we've grown accustomed to hearing when we partake of the Lord's Supper, but there's, there's so much more here, especially in light of Easter. So we're going to take this morning and see what Jesus was saying, what it, it means for us today. And when we watch for our returning queen, when we're looking for his return, I think it means that we continually remember his sacrifice. We remember the sacrifice that he made. Easter is always a time where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, right? That's what last week was. That was that huge celebration that he's back from the dead. He's defeated it. He's defeated sin. He's, he's taken all that on and here he is alive. But along with that, we always go back and we read or we watch or we look at Jesus's road to the cross. That's why we do journey to the cross, it's an opportunity to come in and kind of look at, at Jesus' life, to see what led up to the events on Easter. And, and there's a good portion of the journey that takes you through those last days of, of, of his, his torture, of the things that he endured on his way to the cross. His sacrifice was so great, and yet he was so willing to do it. I mean, our God gives up his only son 
His only son to take on the sin of the world. He's, Jesus is this spotless, this perfect lamb who knew no sin, didn't know it at all. And he takes it all on for us. He dies our death. He takes on scars that belong on our bodies. Even, he even has his father to a point where his father cannot look on him. His father has to turn away. We need to remember it as it was. We, we, we can't water it down. We can't make it anything less. When we look at his sacrifice, it points to the depth, the great depth of the love God has for us. I assume most of you have probably at some point seen The Passion of the Christ, the, the big movie from years ago. And, and it's not one that you go back and watch time and time again, but I suggest watching it at least once just to get a glimpse, just to get an inkling of what Jesus went through. Yeah, it's a big movie production, but I think they did a pretty good job of, of representing what Christ truly endured in those days. Sometimes we can, we can get a picture that's not fully the sacrificial picture that we should have. I mean, I've seen pictures where, where Christ is on the cross and there's like grips of blood here and here and at his feet and, and, on, and that's not it. I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable to really look at the sacrifice, to look at what he endured just so, just so we could know God personally. It's hard to stomach it, and I get that, but I think too often we can think of his sacrifice very flippantly without even trying, and we miss out on the truth that it should have been us, right? I mean, it, it, he didn't have to do it. We, we should long to see him return just so we can thank him face to face for stepping in. I mean, that, if that's all we get to do, that should be plenty. I mean, he gave up his life for sinners like us. And when we think about this in the context of the Lord's Supper, don't overlook the words he speaks about his body as he shares the bread and as he shares the cup. When, when we, I mean, think about his body. Think about his blood. Look at what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus is speaking of the coming sacrifice that he is going to make as they sit here eating together. Now, again, I don't think they understood it fully, right? They, they weren't grasping exactly what he was saying, but this is it. We, we know what Jesus is about to face. We, we can read that and, 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 and we get the symbolism of his words of what is to come. Let the truth of what Jesus says here hang over the words that he shares. Imagine hearing them and knowing what was about to happen. We hear it more clearly because we're on this side of the story. We look back at this and we go, oh my gosh, he's talking about his body being ripped apart. He's talking about his blood being poured out. We get it. At least we should. We remember the sacrifice he made. We're reminded of the cost. His, his broken body hanging on the cross. His, his body being taken down and placed in this borrowed grave. His blood. I mean, when, when we think about his blood, I mean, when you think of something being poured out, that's very different than a trickle. And he says, my, my blood is being poured out for you. And he did it for the entire world. He did it for everybody. His blood was needed to cover the debt. Again, it should have been mine. It, it should have been yours. But he drank the cup that the Father had placed before him. Go back to the garden. Remember his prayer? I mean, he's pleading with his dad. Father, if there's any other way... But, but if not, he says, your will, not mine. I'll, I'll drink the cup that you've put before me. And he does, even though most don't accept him as Savior. 
See, as we start to watch more faithfully for our returning king, my prayer is that we never forget the sacrifice that he willingly became to appease the wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to do it because the reality is we couldn't have done it. None of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. As we watch for him, as we partake in his supper today, it's a time of remembrance that that should push us to to not just look back, though, but to look forward. We, We should remember his sacrifice, but we should also expect his return. As I've gone through Easter this year, I've, I've, I've kind of focused on this truth more and more. The truth that because he was resurrected from the dead, because he came back from the dead, he is alive and he's going to come back at some point to claim his church as he said he would. I mean, that, honest to goodness, that is amazing. He, 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 he comes back from the dead like he said he would. So why would I have any reason to doubt that he's going to come back for us like he said he would? He's, uh, it's a promise he made. And here's the thing. Uh, every promise I've seen him make in scripture, he kept. Why would this one be any different? I'm praying for God to turn my heart toward him in a way that I truly expect him to just show up, to return at any point. I'm, I'm hoping I'm looking so much that, and believing so much and expecting so much that it impacts the way I live. I said, I've been in church my whole life for, for 40, am I 44, my family? 43, I can't remember. Okay, we're good. I, I, I thought you'd know. It's the children that keep that tally. Dad's this old. All right, so I'm in my 40s, right? 40 some years, I have heard my whole life, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming. I, I, back when the days when revivals for a week long, right, and, and evangelists would come in, and that's what they talked about. Jesus was coming back. He's, the signs of the time are nigh. He's, he's here. We're in the last days. We've been in the last days for a long time. The moment he ascended into heaven, we were in the last days, right? Okay, please get that. And yeah, signs are popping up all over the place. Things are falling into place. It's going to happen, But after hearing it for 44 years, there's times where I go, well, if I'm honest with myself, um, yeah, I'd say he's coming back, but probably not in my lifetime. Well, that doesn't sound like you expect his return at any point. Do I? Do you? I mean, here's the reality. We expect his return, but we aren't expecting it right now. If we all thought today was the day that Jesus was coming back at 1116, these seats would be full, right? Because this is where we'd want to be if he was coming back on a Sunday. We don't want to be caught outside the church on a Sunday if he's coming back. But how do, I mean, let's honestly ask ourselves, do we believe he's coming back at any point right here and right now? There, there's a lot of times where, where we just it seems way off. And so we want to live the life we've got here. We talk about how Israel missed Jesus on earth the first time, right? They were looking for him. They had heard the prophecies. And guess what happened? They missed him. They did worse than miss him. They killed him. And we think, well, how stupid. They, they, what the world? We're watching and we're waiting, but are we really do we, do we really expect his, I mean, if we expected his return at any moment, I think we'd live a little bit differently than we probably do. I know this is mean. I know this is harsh, but this is true. And I'm not, I'm not speaking at you. I'm, I'm, I'm included in this. We say we're watching. We say we're waiting, but are we really? Do we, do we believe it so much that it causes us to live as if he might come back in the next breath? I mean, do we expect the next time that we take the Lord's Supper, he's going to be there with us? We should. We we should be looking for him. We should be watching for him. We should be expecting him to come back. Because when Jesus, here he is, he's given these elements of the Lord's Supper to these guys. And look at what he tells them. He says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's not drinking it until he does it with him in the kingdom of God. There's a reason it was called the Last Supper. Because it was. And it is until he returns. 
So remember him when you partake. Glance back. Take into account the sacrifice he has made for you and for our world. Remember it and what it means. But then look forward. Look ahead to the next time with him in his father's kingdom. It's not going to happen until he comes back for his bride, for the church, for us. When we gather around his supper table, come with that expectation that the next time it's going to be in glory with him. I mean, come on. What if that were the case? Expect it to be in his presence and let that drive that longing deeper that you want to see his return and you want to see his return sooner and sooner. This idea of his return should get us excited and I'm talking way past Smithgrove excited. I've seen Smithgrove excited. You all are in for a shocking awakening when you get to heaven. <clears throat> It, should, it shouldn't just get us excited, though. It should reinforce this bond that is between us as his body, right? When, when we think about all of this, when, when we gather around his table, it's as a family, it's as his bread. We're to gather and take this bread and juice. Let that stir something in you. Don't just go through it because we're doing it. Let it, let it speak to your heart. We, here's the thing. When we come to the table up here, you know what? You don't bring anything with you. But as you walk away, you have what he has provided for us. I mean, he is who we're focused on. And, and, and we're doing it as one. Let us be his church, watching and anticipating for when he will come back for us. So when we think of him as returning king, we, we've got to remember his sacrifice. We've got to expect his return. And finally... Finally, I think it causes us to share his message, or at least it should, right? When you look closely at the Lord's Supper, we see the gospel presentation through it. As Jesus speaks of the bread, as he talks of the cup, we hear of his physical incarnation, his, his sacrificial death, and his coming kingdom. Have you ever thought about it that way before? If not, please do. Please see the gospel presentation this morning. Please hear it. Please, please look at these elements in just a little bit different way. It's a call not just to remember and expect, but to also share. I've, I spent the last week or so, I was looking at passages of Jesus' interactions with, with his disciples after his resurrection, right? And uh, Thursday morning, Amazing Grace Fellowship, I kind of talked with them a little bit about one of those, those encounters, and another thing that strikes me in Jesus' death and resurrection, and we see it first at the tomb, right? The ladies come, and they, they, they don't find Jesus, but then they encounter Jesus, and Jesus, what's Jesus tell them to do? Go tell somebody. Go tell the disciples, right? Well, then you get into the room where, where Jesus meets with them after he's resurrected, and these guys are scared. They're behind locked doors. They're, they're not sure what's going on, and here Jesus appears, and you know what he tells them? He doesn't say, take, a time, take some time here and just let's, let's gather. He, he says, Here's, here I am. This is me. Now go. Go tell people. Go let them know what has happened. Go tell them the story of, of my life, of my death, of my resurrection. He, he encourages them. He commands them to go and share his story. And we see that even here while he's participating in the, his last Passover with him, they are told to do this meal over and over until he comes back. And part of that's to help them focus on continuing to tell his story to each other and to the world. As we remember and as we expect him, we should be encouraged to speak of him constantly, continually, and frequently. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 again. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do you do? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're to proclaim his death until he returns. We are to proclaim his death each time we eat the bread and drink the cup. We're to speak of his life, his death, his resurrection, and his return until he returns. You keep hearing me say, talk about Jesus with each other. This fits in perfectly here. We've got to start talking about him with each other. We've got to do it here 
And then we've also got to talk with people outside of here about who Jesus is. I'm not going to drop this. We're not going to escape these directions, these commands that Jesus has voiced. I mean, if we consider what he's told his followers in Scripture, guess what? Same goes for us. Get out there. Share who he is. While we do the Lord's Supper periodically, our proclamation of our Lord and Savior should be frequent and it should be continually increasing daily. In order to share his message, we've got to know his message. We've got to believe his message. We've, we need to have experienced his message. And when we truly remember the sacrifice he made and we expect his return, I think we come to a point where we can do nothing else but share his message. I mean, if he's who we're thinking about and if he's who we're looking for, it's not the only thing we can focus on. My prayer through this Easter season is that we've gained a deeper understanding, a, a, a more clear view of our Jesus as king. He's a king unlike any the world has ever known or ever will know. But we know him personally. I mean, think about that. He's a king that loves perfectly, that sacrifices fully, a king that defeated death and sin, a king that stands for true justice and mercy, who's gracious, and a king who can save anyone who calls on him. We could go on and on about him because he's that great. And one day, he'll be the returning king. As we bring our Easter series to a close today, like I said, we're going to end with the Lord's Supper. We're going to gather around the table as a family. We're going to partake of the bread and the cup. It's an opportunity to practice what we've heard today, to think on the sacrifice that he made, to, to look forward and expect his return. It's an opportunity for us to share the gospel with one another right here. We're going to walk through this, then we're going to sing a song to close. Throughout that entire time, let's look at ourselves as one. Partake in his, his supper together. Sing a song, lifting your voices high and loud. I know some of you like to lip sync, right? For various reasons. I'm calling you out. Doesn't matter if you sing beautiful, doesn't matter if you are a cl uh, clanging cymbal. Sing out. Let your voice, let the words you sing encourage those around. I keep talking about sharing Christ with each other. We can do that through song. Do it. See the gospel as we walk through the Lord's Supper. As you walk out, share Christ with one another. This is a great, great opportunity for us to remember, to expect, and to share. I'll, I'll kind of walk you through that process as we, we get a little bit closer. But I'm going to pray now, and then we'll, we'll get ready to partake of the Lord's Supper. So let's, let's pray. Father God, once more, I thank you for an opportunity to share your word. I thank you for this time that we've been focused on uh, Easter and your resurrection and what that looks like in our lives. And Father, the king that you are, the king that you've always been, and Father, the king that we're trying to see you as today, I pray, Father, that you just... Help us to focus solely on you right now. As we come together as your family, as we come together as your body, as your bride, as your church, bond us in this moment. As we partake of, of the bread and the cup, Father, the, let us see the sacrifice. Let us hear your words of you're not going to do this until you come back. And how sweet that will be to partake of this with you. So God, continue to meet with us now. Continue to, to, to mold us. Continue to, to, to grow us deeper in our faith. And Father, continue to have us looking for you and allow that to cause us to just want to tell people about you. So God, bless this time. Be honored in this time. Be glorified as we walk through this in Jesus' name. Amen.